it's Chef Bay. I'm so excited to have you here on my YouTube channel. I am the author of this amazing cookbook, Cook, Heal, Go Vegan. I'm also the host of the Plant Remedy Podcast. You'll find all things podcast, cookbook, healing, wellness, recipes, all things vegan on this YouTube site. And I'm just so excited to have you here. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop them below and I will personally answer them myself. And if you want to find out more about me, you can do so on all these social channels here. If you love this video, I would be so grateful if you could like and comment and subscribe to my channel and of course share with a friend if you think it would resonate with them. I hope you enjoy this video and I'll see you soon. What's up you guys? Welcome to the Plant Remedy Podcast. It's your host Chef Bay. And I'm so excited to be here as usual. If it's your first time listening to the show, thank you so much for being here. I am a professional plant-based chef, as well as a cookbook author, podcast host, and I live in San Diego, California. Today, I am coming at you from the floor of my bedroom. I've got the surfboards behind me. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see that. Um, but it's nice to kind of like record in different places in my house to get different energies and just like different inspiration. Um, through all the different things around me. So thank you so much for being here and taking the time to just listen and tune in to our show today. Today, we have an amazing conversation with Kanchan Koya. She has a PhD from Harvard Medical School in cancer biology and cell biology. And she's the creator of Spice Spice Baby. And she's used it as a cookbook, as well as a platform and blog to help educate people about the health benefits of spices. And she also like infuses modern wisdom with science or ancient wisdom and science, modern, ancient, it's all coming together. And I'm so excited about this episode because I truly believe in what some people would call, I hate this term, but they call it like woo woo, but it's really like ancient wisdom. It's really connecting to the earth. It's really using your intuition and it's understanding that like food has so much power. And, you know, I talk about this all the time. I've talked about it in my book. I talk about it on my social channels. I talk about it on this podcast, but like, it is the idea that food has so much power. Our environment, our personal ecosystem has so much power. And I love this conversation because we dive so deep into the power of food. Not only do we talk about remedies for anxiety and heartburn and bloating, which is actually one of my favorite topics because as a girl with endo, I definitely experience bloating more than I would like to. And um, we also just talk about the power of ritual, the power of using spices. And we even talk about integrating using spices and different flavors and techniques with young children, which is really cool because I really do feel like we live in a society that kind of expects kids to want bland food when in reality, spices are super healthy for kids. And I'm just so excited about this conversation because, um, it's definitely like lighthearted and really fun. And we touch on a lot of issues that I get a lot of questions about all the time and, um, that we're all dealing with all the time, right? We live in a world that is totally consumed by chemicals and pharmaceuticals and, um, you know, sometimes our food isn't safe or sometimes, you know, there's a, just a lot going on that our bodies are constantly dealing with. And I love talking about ancient ritual and kind of going back to our roots, um, as humans in eating and enjoying things like spices and really simple plant-based foods and enjoying lentils and really talking about just sinking our bodies to the natural rhythms of nature. And I love that there is science now that backs this. So it's not woo woo anymore. It is like proven that it works, which is just like, obviously, you know, um, it's so funny. Steve and I last night, were actually talking about how science and spirituality even are starting to come together and all these new images of space and the, this God molecule that they found. Um, it's all really interesting how the more that science progresses, the more that it matches up with ancient wisdom. And it's kind of proving that our intuition and all these things that we intuitively know is actually 
the truth, right? It's like our ancestors knew they didn't need um, a clinical trial or like a a study with 50,000 people to tell you and prove that turmeric is anti-inflammatory or that eating plants or lentils is great for your digestion. Like it's just there. It was just obvious. It was just like intuitive ancient wisdom. And I love that about where science is going. I love that about where the food industry is going. I love that even that there are people like Hanchen who are talking about modern science, but also being like, yeah, like ancient wisdom is a thing and we have to be able to blend the two. And this arguing back and forth that I see online between like science versus like, you know, Ayurveda, like it's not some anything to argue about, like it all can coexist together. And I think we can have, see the most power and the most benefit with ourselves, the environment, health of our children, health of our parents, um, when we really kind of blend all the things that we know from ancient wisdom and from modern science. So I'm really excited for you guys to listen to this episode. Before we get into it, I'm so excited to announce that I officially have a free training coming out and it's coming out on the 24th of July and it's going to be amazing. It's called how to harness cycle syncing for cycle healing. I've been talking a ton about healing our periods, healing our cycles, managing our symptoms. If you have something like PCOS, endometriosis, like me, um, and I'm just diving in, I'm leaning all the way into this topic because it is literally what got me to where I am today. And I just have so much information and knowledge that I want to share with you guys, because I have gotten thousands and thousands and thousands of comments and direct messages from people who experience periods about how much y'all are struggling (laughs) and I have been there. So I just want to be able to help you. And, um, if you know someone that struggles with period pain or just like wants to understand our periods better and how to kind of like sync it with nature, it's that whole concept of syncing with nature. I'm teaching a free training. Um, and you can kind of pick what time works for you. So it's not going to be live but it is going to be um, interactive and you're going to be able to kind of like make it work with your schedule, which I'm so excited about. So during this free training, you'll learn what cycle syncing is um, and how to sync your lifestyle with each phase of your cycle. It's a lot easier than you might think. And even if you're, you know, reaching menopause or you're don't experience a period, you can still cook for someone who does or share this information. Or if you're like on birth control or you're trying to get your period back, um, this can also really help as well. And it is, and we'll also talk about the most powerful foods for each phase of your cycle and what to lean into and what to stay away from, which I think is really important. I think a lot of times we talk about like, oh, don't think about the foods we want to get rid of, only think about the foods you want to add in. But I think talking about the foods you want to get rid of is really important, especially when we're talking about our periods. And then we're also going to talk about how to manage period pains with food and lifestyle, which works for any budget. Because I know sometimes you think, oh, this is going to cost me so much money to like buy all these things and do all this stuff. But there's a lot of things that you can do that doesn't cost any money. Um, or it's just like a, a shift in what you're buying, what you're consuming or how you're living. So we're going to talk all about that. So if you guys want to sign up, you can sign up through the free pop-up on my website at www.chefbay.kitchen. You'll enter in your email. And then when it's ready to go, you will get an email um, letting you know that it's ready to go. You can pick a time to watch the free training and that's that super simple. (sighs) So excited. So go to www.chefbay.kitchen and enter in your email and you'll get all the information that you need when it does go, um, live and available to watch in just a couple weeks. I'm so excited. I've been working day and night on this. Um, there's a big announcement at the end of the training, which, I'm hyped about. I've been working all year. I've been dropping hints and it's all about our periods. And um, I'm going to do a full solo episode on it, on how I kind of came to this conclusion of why I wanted to kind of, you know, focus on this. And um, yeah, I don't think I'm going to go too much into that now because I'm going to let this be about this episode, but stay tuned. We are nearing the end of this season. So there's just a couple episodes left. 
Um, and if you guys love the show, I really appreciate a review on Apple podcasts, or if you share on social media, I will repost for sure. And I've been getting a ton of DMS from you guys loving the show, listening to like episodes from the very beginning, which is hilarious because it's a little bit embarrassing because I had no idea what I was doing back then, but I still love that you guys are listening to the OG episodes and really enjoying the podcast. And I'm just so grateful for your listenership and for your time. And it really just really means the world to me and my husband, Steve, who produces the show. It's just literally amazing. Love you guys so much. Okay. Let's get into this episode. I know you're going to love it. Hi, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm so, so excited to talk to you and to just like dive into all things spices. Oh, thank you, Bailey. It's so nice to meet you and chat. I'm excited as well. Sweet. How, how's your day going? How's, how's life over on your side of the world? I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's been a week um, with the news and everything going on. And, you know, I just, um, yeah, just trying to stay grounded, take care of myself, take care of my family, kind of just get everybody centered, grounded. Yeah. But it has been a little nutty this week for sure. I know it feels like we're living in some sort of like augmented reality where you just like don't want to open your phone or open anything because you don't want to read any new news is kind of how I'm feeling. Totally agree. And I do think, you know, that even aside from this week, like we just um, consume way too much media that, it, you know, I think beyond what is healthy for our brain, our nervous system. Um, and so sometimes, yeah, I think just con- consciously kind of taking a break from just consumption. I mean, I talk a lot about fasting and intermittent fasting and that sort of thing but sometimes like fasting in terms of media consumption and what we're putting into our minds I think can also be really you know powerful yeah definitely I mean like so many people I talk to are struggling with anxiety like who've never struggled with anxiety before and I mean it's been one hell of a last two years and I think that we just have all this stuff coming at us all the time and no time before in history have we had like the world news like this on a minute by minute update basis, all the things that are happening in the world where it's like, there's always been things happening, but there's never been this much influx. So yeah, I'm feeling totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. um, uh, Media detox. Yeah, (laughs) definitely. (laughs) First, first, first prescription of the show is a media detox for sure. I'd love for you to just, if like our listeners don't know who you are much about you, I'd love to just hear a little bit of background about your story um, and what brought you here. Yeah, thanks. So um, I, you know, I can take it way back. I grew up in India for the first 18 years of my life. And then I came to the U S for college when I was 18, um, big culture shock, but also very exciting. Yeah, I went to college in Texas. um, And, you know, I was always really interested in biology and molecular biology and science. So I pursued um, a graduate degree. I did my PhD at Harvard Medical School, um, focused on cancer biology and um, cell biology. And I loved it. But I knew deep down that I wanted to sort of bridge disciplines. I was very interested in food and cooking. I'm a foodie at heart. I just love to eat. I love to cook. And actually what happened is my lab, um, in the course of studying DNA repair and cancer, basically discovered turmeric had some anti-cancer properties. And I had grown up in India where the spice box is just integral to our kitchen, but Mm. also to our sort of pharmacy, Um, Indian traditional medicine, which is known as Ayurveda, really celebrates and reveres spices, especially things like turmeric um, for its health benefits. So I had grown up with a lot of that ancient wisdom passed down to me through my grandmother, my parents, you know, my aunties. And um, fast forward, now I'm in Boston at Harvard Medical School and my lab starts studying turmeric. So I think it was a real light bulb moment for me where I was like, wow, all this cool ancient wisdom around these natural ingredients is now, you know, bearing out in modern science and research and how cool is that? And I think it was kind of a a seed was planted in my mind that, oh, this is really interesting. And then fast forward a few years where I dabbled in sort of biotechnology and drug development. Um, I remember this moment where I was on a run, I had just become a mother and I was like, what do I really want to do with my life if no one cared 
what I did with my resume or what my resume looked like, like what's my true passion. And it just really was like this intersection of food and health. And so I started Spice Spice Baby as a platform, a blog to educate people about the health benefits of spices. And I guess it just grew from there into what is now, you know, a wider platform, a movement, really my effort to educate people on how to live and eat well for vitality and also just enjoy delicious food along the way. Yes. I mean, you have to have both, right? You have to have the nutrition and also like enjoyment. Otherwise no one's going to be into it. (laughs) No one's going to be into it. And I think you don't have to make the sacrifice. Like I don't think healthy food needs to be drab and lackluster, Totally, you know, totally speaking my language. And I know that's, yeah, I know that's your jam. Your cookbook is so beautiful and your recipes are so vibrant and yeah, exactly. I I don't think we have to make that trade off. And, you know, so hopefully people are excited to eat in a way that really supports their well-being. Yeah, definitely. I think it's really cool, like thinking about your history and that moment, that aha moment of like, wow, this ancient wisdom and also like this intuition that's kind of like brought to you from food and spices just gets played out in science as being like, yeah, this is, this is actually legitimate. And it's cool to see like science evolve and see all these things that feel intuitive of like, yeah, this makes sense, you know, but before maybe there wasn't scientific evidence to back it, but now there's more scientific evidence to back these things. And I think that's a really cool place to be where the ancient wisdom and the modern science kind of like come together. And it's like, yeah, this is all totally legit. Yeah, Bailey, it's really, it always blows my mind how our ancestors knew, um, you know, whether it was spices or particular herbs or certain foods, yeah. having these healing properties. I mean, there was probably some trial and error, but there was also, I think, like you mentioned, a huge reliance on intuition, which maybe we've a little, we've kind of like lost a little bit. I mean, going back to the earlier part of our conversation, I feel like we're consuming so much that we've, whether it's food or media, we've like lost the ability to connect with our intuition. Um, and I think our intuition can be very wise. So yeah, it always blows my mind how they knew, you know, that turmeric yes. was like, the jam. <laughs> oh my gosh. So true. And I think, you know, when the, like what you said, when we have that intuitive moment where we're like, I feel like this is good for me, we're trained to like question everything now. So like if your intuition is screaming, there's also this part of your brain that's like, well, is this legitimate? Like, should I question it? And sometimes, yeah, we just have to go with the intuition. Cause if we don't go yeah. with that, then we'll probably regret it. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. So I just like love your use of spices. I mean, I love spices, obviously, as a chef. And I think so many people are so afraid to use spices and to like stock their spice cabinet. They kind of see, for instance, like a recipe that uses spices and they're like, okay, like this is going to be expensive. I'm going to use the spice one time. And like, is this even worth it? So I'd love to kind of just like talk about, you know, your intro to getting people to use more spices, why they're so important and, um, just like, and like easier ways to kind of incorporate them and play with them. So it doesn't feel so like rigid and following a recipe. Yeah. So I definitely think people are intimidated by spices and I don't fault them because not every culture or cuisine, you know, embraces spices the way others do. Right. Um, and I just happen to come from a culture and cuisine that really does. So I'm grateful for that. I will challenge people who say they never use spices by saying, you know, pepper is a spice. Totally. Um, we use salt and pepper all the time. And pepper, in fact, was such a valuable spice back in the day that like people would trade peppercorns in exchange for like oxen or like, I don't know, other thing. Like it was like, a, it was, it was literally like currency because it was hard to grow and hard to harvest. So Pepper is a spice and we use pepper and just like learning anything new, whether it's cooking or, you know, playing an instrument or doing a new kind of movement practice, you can learn to use more spices. And the beautiful thing about it is that there are multiple rewards. So the rewards are your food is going to taste amazing. Yes. Um, without the need for like added, you know, extra fat and sugar and like some of the things that are not so great for us. So you can really elevate your food to be absolutely delicious, mouthwatering just by using more herbs and spices. 
Um, secondly, cooking becomes more fun. You can really like get adventurous in the kitchen. And as a chef, you know that, you know, once you have that spice box and it's like your toolkit, it just becomes playful and exciting. And then thirdly, you're, and you know, for me, what is the most exciting is that your health will thank you for it. Mm. Um, we have so much accumulating evidence now that spices and culinary amounts can have really powerful effects on our health and address some of our really pressing modern day health challenges like inflammation, for example, being the big one. You know, everyone wants to eat an anti-inflammatory diet. Spices actually lower inflammation after a single meal. And mm. this is like now done, shown in a randomized controlled trial. So I just think like it's a win, win, win all around. And then in terms of like how to go about it, um, you know, so that's like the why, like this is why I think people should be using spices more often. And in terms of the how, like, I think you can just start in simple ways. So I always tell people pick five spices or even three, three to five spices that you want to introduce into your kitchen. I'm happy to share my top five that are like great introductory spices. And the reason I pick them is because they're versatile, they're easy to use, and they pair really well with different types of food. Now, I love Indian food. My husband is like American, born and raised. He has some Indian heritage, but you know, he doesn't really want to eat Indian food every day because that's not what he grew up eating. So yeah. he's like, yeah, I love Indian like a couple of days a week, but then I want to eat like Thai or, you know, a, a sandwich or like a risotto or a pasta or whatever, yeah. like a diverse, like globally inspired food. And so I like to pick like three or five spices that I think work with all cuisines because not everybody's eating like Indian food or whatever, like, you know, totally. foods that are more traditionally used with spice. So um, do you want me to dive into my top yeah, five? Yeah, right now. Beginner Let's do spices? it. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. So number one is turmeric um, because it is obviously, you know, worthy of all the accolades it gets in terms of the health benefits. And it's so easy and versatile to use. I'll give you like, you know, three things that almost everybody um, can put it in starting today would be like, say you have rice or cauliflower rice, instead of just using, you know, oil, garlic, add a little turmeric done it's beautiful it's yellow um it's vibrant it's the the flavor is delicate and subtle unless you really go overboard with the quantity yeah um and then you know you would always pair turmeric with black pepper for optimal health benefits and we can talk more about that um second one would be paprika or anything in the sort of pepper family so sweet paprika smoked paprika super versatile roast potatoes roast cauliflower yeah um, you know, my you're husband, some quinoa. Yeah. My husband loves paprika. Like it's his favorite. We go through so much of it. He like just loves it on so much stuff. I love that you said that. You can yeah. literally put it. I mean, there's, I can't think of anything savory that you couldn't really put it on. Like it's yeah. really, really just so easy to use. And totally. the beautiful thing is you're getting, you know, you're getting some of those antioxidants, you're getting some anti-inflammatory compounds. You don't have to eat this is the one thing people always get confused or feel intimidated by is like, oh, spices are spicy. I don't like hot food. Not all spices are spicy. In yeah. fact, aside from the chili peppers and maybe black pepper, if you're really sensitive, you know, spices are flavorful, aromatic, not spicy. So with paprika, you're getting a lot of those benefits of the chili peppers without the heat. If you yes. want something hotter, you could do like cayenne pepper or another kind of chili pepper. Um, third spice would be sumac. Um, it's, it comes from the Middle East and it, it has this like lemony, beautiful, earthy, fruity, like, oh my gosh, I just my love favorite. it. It is my jar. favorite. Yes. It is my oh. all time favorite. I love sumac so much. It's actually really hard to find though in, con in conventional grocery stores for some reason. It is one of the ones that is like so tough for people to find. Yeah. So I would just go online. There's so many beautiful, like single origin spice yes. companies now bringing like amazing sumac straight from the farm to your kitchen. And oh my gosh, you can sprinkle it on all your salads, your avocado toast, you know, um, your hummus, your baba ganoush, like, I don't know, like pretty much anytime you would think of adding lemon or lime, you just add sumac yeah. and it just wakes up the dish. And of course it has antioxidants because it's that beautiful purple color mm -hmm. that we know nature you know, there's anthocyanins, which are these beneficial compounds. So those are my three to start with. So it's, it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to, 
the biggest piece of advice that I can give is like, don't feel like you have to make some complicated spiced up recipe. Take the things you already make and spice them up as yeah. a starting point. Definitely. Can you talk about the importance of toasting your spices before you cook them? Yeah. So spices contain beneficial compounds, which we're obviously interested in and we've talked about. And it turns out that a lot of these compounds are activated by heat. Mm. So when you toast them, um, from a culinary perspective, you wake up the flavors in the spice. If you have an old spice jar in the back of your cabinet and you want to sort of enliven it, just dry toast it in a skillet for like 30 seconds on a medium flame and you will start to smell the spice. And that's because you're waking up a lot of those aromatic compounds that also have the health benefits. Um, so, you know, I think for both those reasons, sort of toasting it before you eat it or cook it, cook with it is great. Oftentimes, if you're layering it into a recipe, you'll automatically be exposing it to heat. So, you know, the simplest example is like, I mean, just yesterday, I made some sauteed green beans, and I use the usual like some shallots and garlic and olive oil. But then I added a little bit of turmeric to turn them into just a healthier, more vibrant yeah. green bean dish. Yeah. And when you add that turmeric to the oil, you're automatically kind of you know, blooming the spice, giving it that heat and contact with fat, which all of which is going to help activate the flavor and the health benefits. Yeah, definitely. I love it. And it's nice to kind of add the spices in when you layer them, when you're kind of cooking, you can layer them at different times too, to kind of bring out more totally. flavors or less flavors, depending on whether you're using the seed or you're using the ground version. So, um, even just something at like a cumin cumin, right. You can use a seed, you can use the powdered cumin. I'm actually drinking your CCLT right in this moment. Oh I'm, no, you're not. That's so cool. Yeah. I, yeah. I always have like weird bloating bloating issues. I don't know if it's from like stress or working too much or whatever it is. It's always something that I've just been dealing with the last couple of years. And so I, I take some different digestive enzymes, but I don't know, it was like last month or something. I saw you post about the CCLT and I was like, I'm going to try it. And I literally addicted to it. It's so good. Immediately helps with my digestion. Like it's like instant and, or I drink it right before bed and I wake up and I just feel so good. I have great bowel movements. So yeah. Cheers. Yeah. To you. Oh my God, that makes me so happy. It is such a cool um, remedy and anyone can make it. Um, in ancient Ayurveda, you know, so CCFT is cumin, coriander, fennel. And um, it was really a trifecta of herbs that was recommended for a digestion boost. And it's it has these like beautiful balancing properties. So it can boost digestion, but it can also cool the digestive tract. So it can help people who suffer from heartburn or constipation or like it kind of like balances things out. So I've, I know people who have gas and bloating who find it, you know, find it beneficial acidity or heartburn, find it beneficial, just sluggish digestion, which can sometimes cause the bloating. Yeah. Things are just not moving along. Um, it can like, yeah, it really, for me is like, and there's no downside and it's so easy to make like a teaspoon of cumin, coriander and fennel seeds in like 16 ounces of hot water, steep for 10 minutes and sip, you know, um, so easy. And yeah, I totally, it's been a game changer for me. Cause I definitely had some heartburn. Like I tend to be hyper acidic, so it's really cooled my digestive tract. I have it every single night before bed too. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I don't know. There's something about drinking it right before bed that I love. And yeah, the, over the last, I think like six months, I started to get heartburn, which I had never experienced before, mm -hmm. which was very weird for me. I was like, Oh, this is what this feels like. It's like so spicy, but yeah, I just, ever since I started drinking the tea, I just get no heartburn anymore. So yeah. Yeah. And another really simple spice remedy for heartburn is literally just taking the fennel seeds alone and steeping those in hot water and sipping that. In fact, you know, when they give babies, um, babies who have colic, they give them gripe water or they used to. Yeah. That's literally fennel water. So fennel has some really amazing, um, it can help with IBS. It can help with gut inflammation, overheated gut. It is like, I don't know, I chew on fennel seeds after every meal, like just a little pinch. So I think it's a wonderful spice for digestion. I love that. I think we like just as a society now, because there's just so much information. There's so many people on social media talking about so many different things. There's so, you know, there's just so much of everything that we tend to just like overcomplicate, overcomplicate everything. And I, this is just such a nice reminder that we can just go 
back to nature, back to earth and simplify like what we're doing to help with our digestion and how we're eating and chewing on fennel seeds, like right after your meal, it seems so like silly almost because there's all these other complicated things or digestive enzymes or supplements or whatever, but like a fennel seed is like as close to nature as you can get. And it, it really does make all the difference. And it's just like such a nice reminder to keep it simple. I love that. Yeah. I mean, one of my biggest um, motivations is I agree with you. I think we've lost our connection to the simplicity and to nature. And I think it's showing up and manifesting in all sorts of like imbalances and health issues. And then as a remedy, we try to overcomplicate things when I think the solution can be going back to the simple basics that, that mother nature offers and spices are definitely one of them. Yeah, definitely. So I really wanted to ask you about spices and kids because I think, I mean, I don't personally have children, but a lot of my clients do just, you know, they're everywhere. Kids are everywhere. And I just think that people are so afraid to give their kids food that have spice to them. And I think it contributes to this idea that kids only like, like macaroni and cheese or like chips or whatever, because there is this there is this like rhetoric going on that has been going on for, I mean, since the nineties, I don't know. That's just kids only like simple processed cheesy kind of foods. And I love what you talk about because it really kind of changes that narrative and it changes. It's like, no kids like what you give them. And I just would love to talk about the benefits of giving kids spices and how to kind of like introduce kids to a more colorful palette rather than just like this bread and butter kind of vibe. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, that was really the inspiration for why I started Spice Spice Baby in the first mm. place. I have, I was a mom. I was, you know, my son was six months old. I started him on solids and just intuitively, probably because I'm Indian and I grew up in India and I ate probably spices the first time I ate anything because yeah. everything is, has some spice in it. Um, I just automatically gave him, you know, pureed sweet potato with some cardamom or like avocado and lentils with some turmeric and cumin. And I had my mom friends here in New York City say, oh, that's so interesting. I didn't know you can do that. And I think it made me realize, like you said, you know, there are these kind of misconceptions or just like habits or ways of doing things. I talked to my pediatrician and you know, here in New York. And she said, there's really no scientific or health basis to give kids bland food. But for some reason, we feel like their palates can't handle as much flavor. Now, there are some kids who are like super tasters and pretty sensitive, but I think most kids just love what you give them and what they're exposed to. So I always say, you know, start by exposing them to a wide variety of flavor and spices can be a really great way to achieve that. Not to mention that you're exposing them to those antioxidants, anti-inflammatory compounds um, on a regular basis. Um, So yeah, I mean, I would say if you're, if you have a baby and you're giving them baby food, think of simple spice additions, you know, one, like, like a lot of babies suffer from digestive distress. So cumin is a really nice spice to start with. Like if you're doing lentils or, um, you know, any, any, if you're doing like carrots and peas, which is a really common puree that people give babies, you know, add a little cumin and turmeric to that. Um, if you're doing sweet potato, add cinnamon or cardamom to that or clove, like a little pinch, you're adding a little bit of complexity of flavor, I mean, we don't want our kids to only eat white foods. Trust me, my kids love mac and cheese, but they also love like a great chickpea curry, you know, and it's only because I expose them to it over time. Some kids need multiple exposures. Some of the data show that for some kids, it can literally take 10 exposures to a food before they will try it. So, you know, sometimes persistence and patience is required, but I also feel like if the whole family is eating spices and a wide variety of flavors, and then the kid is basically getting what the family gets, ultimately they will kind of come on board. So um, yeah, I mean, spice up your baby's life, spice up your baby's health and, you know, just expose them to flavor and expand their palates. I love that. And it's also thinking about the idea that like our palate is like any muscle that you would exercise. You can't expect like trying something new, especially with children, because they're more sensitive and they sometimes they've had their mind made up about things. You know, you can't expect them to like automatically be into it. And then if they're not just to give up same with ourselves and trying new things too. And being like, Hey, it might take a couple times to like 
be into it or understand it or have that like click happen between our brain and our taste buds. Um, so yeah, totally. it's, a nice, it's a nice reminder to just like be patient and keep trying. And even for yourself, like if you don't like it, like keep trying, you know, like just keep trying. I remember when I first got introduced to sumac, my ex-boyfriend, when I was in my early twenties, um, he's Persian and his family is Persian. And so it's just like all these different flavors. And I never really had been ex like exposed to that kind of food before. And they put sumac on literally everything. And it got to the they point do. where like, we would go to the, you know, the Persian restaurant with the kebabs and stuff. And I would be like, where's the sumac? Give me the more sumac. Like I can't get enough of it. But at first I was like, this is so crazy. Like all these spices that they're using. So it definitely takes time to kind of like get in the, get in the flow of something new. Totally. And another way to get kids into spices is to have them actually help you like, like let them play with the spices. So like the cinnamon sticks mm. or the cardamom pods. Sometimes I would have my kids like smash the cardamom pod open, take out the black seeds and then grind them. And then we'd add them to like a banana oat muffin recipe. And now my kids will play games and be like, Oh, what spice did mommy add to this? You know, it's just fun. And like, cardamom is one of those examples where it has almost like floral luxurious notes and mm. to me it makes everything taste like dessert so you can get away with like less sugar um and also it's a great digestion boosting spice so yeah just so many reasons to kind of get them excited whether they're helping you cook or eat or do a guessing game while they're tasting but like you said like it takes patience and practice but they will get there I love that. So I want to ask you about sugar cravings. Cause I saw, um, I saw you talking about sugar cravings. My husband actually edits these podcasts and he's like the biggest sugar fiend ever. So do you have any like recommendations for spices or just kind of like kicking those sugar cravings in a more like natural way that doesn't feel as restrictive? Totally. So first of all, I tell anyone who suffers from sugar cravings that it's completely natural and normal and you mm. shouldn't like blame yourself or feel like totally. somehow you are less than or don't have the willpower that somebody else does you know the sugar cravings arise for so many reasons but ultimately I think it's this evolutionary mismatch between our ancestral brain that is hardwired to crave certain combinations of foods that simply didn't exist back in the day um, and now it's been sort of put into this modern food environment where we can literally like swim in those foods um, that aren't very good for us. So it's like, we're kind of like fighting this uphill battle a little bit. So I don't blame or fault anyone for a sugar craving. That said, you can change the biochemistry of your brain so that you crave less sugar. I always tell people they don't believe me because now it's like, I'm always eating all these like healthy things on social media. I mean, I do sometimes eat sugar, but not that much because here's the fundamental truth which is like a hard one to swallow the more sugar you eat the more sugar you will crave mm. um it's kind of like anything you know and it just has to do with the reward circuits in your brain it has to do with dopamine so every time you eat sugar you get a little bit of a spike in dopamine in your brain and your brain is like ha ah, this is a wonderful thing but what happens is then you set yourself up where now you need that thing just to feel kind of normal. I mean, it's, it yeah. sounds almost like I'm talking about drugs or illegal drugs, but it's very similar circuitry in the mm -hmm. brain, not to the same degree, but very similar circuits are involved in sugar cravings versus like craving other illegal substances. So the most, the most um, powerful thing to do is to kind of have a strong why for why you don't want to eat so much sugar. And I think once you have that strong why and you recognize that it's not your fault and you kind of have to like biohack like the brain a little bit yeah. to get off the sugar train, then you can come come at it from a slightly more empowered place, like less guilt and shame and like, oh, I don't have the willpower, but more like, oh, I'm going to strategize, you know, so that I can get off the sugar train because I know it's not good for me. Um, number one thing is to just take a break from sugar. It can be hard the first few days, but then it gets easier. And I'm telling you, if you don't eat any refined sugar for 21 days, you will just not crave it as much. And when you eat it, your taste buds change. There is research around this. You will actually yeah. find it too sweet. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of spices that can help, I think you know, I love some of the spices that give you that illusion of luxury and dessert like qualities without the sugar. So like cinnamon, I mean, there's mm. a reason we add cinnamon to all our baked goods in the holidays. 
Um, you know, adding more cinnamon is going to give you that dessert like quality, but it also has the added benefit that cinnamon stabilizes your blood sugar. So um, it can improve insulin function and it can help keep your blood sugar more balanced, which also helps with cravings because we know that cravings also arise from destabilizations in your blood sugar. Anyone who started their day with like a chocolate croissant knows that two hours later, they're like looking for the next thing. Yeah. You know, it's not a satiating food. It sets you up to crave more of those kinds of foods because of these blood sugar dips that happen. Um, so cinnamon cardamom is another great one because it creates that illusion of like a dessert like quality. So I love adding it. For example, if I'm doing oatmeal and I don't really want to add like a lot of sweetener um, or like honey or even some of these like, you know, natural but still like high sugar kind of sweeteners. I will do cinnamon, cardamom, um, some pistachios, which are like a healthy fat and kind mm. of naturally have some sweetness to them. So in terms of just broader strategies, I would say taking the sugar out for a little while um, and really doing like a sugar detox is very powerful. Adding these like sweeter spices like cinnamon, cardamom, um, you know, are, is, is a really nice kind of hack. Um, the most powerful thing you can do for cravings is to send a satiety signal to your brain. So your brain wants to know that you are well-fed. And one of the most powerful ways to do that is to eat protein and fiber. Mm. Um, like, like a bowl of lentils, um, you know, is going to be packed with plant-based protein, but also fiber. And it's going to send this very robust satiety signal to your brain that says, oh, I am I am doing good. Like I'm not in a state of famine. <laughs> We're <you know>? good. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, those satiety signals will really start to regulate the cravings as well. And then in terms of like the question you asked, like fruit, like I talked about fruit on my Instagram recently, like fruit is nature's candy and my kids are like, whatever, no, but it's true. You know, yeah. once you've gone off the refined sugar train and you eat a bowl of berries, you're like, oh my gosh, this is, it, you know, it's natural sugar in the context of this food matrix with fiber and phytonutrients and polyphenols. It's not going to set you up for cravings. It's not going to destabilize your blood sugar. And um, it is really going to give you those sort of healthy, nutritious, natural sugars that we should all be enjoying. You know, sweet potatoes, I love. Yes. Um, and for some people, like some of these higher sugar natural foods can also destabilize their blood sugar because we're very bio-individual and some people will get a blood sugar spike after they eat a sweet potato. But I always say, you know, add cinnamon to the sweet potato to make it more tasty and not spike your blood sugar. And one of the most powerful ways to deal with these blood sugar destabilizations and cravings is to go for a short walk after a meal, mm -hmm. which is also like a really nice ritual even a 10 minute walk after a meal can help stabilize your blood sugar and reduce the sort of, you know, subsequent craving that can happen if your blood sugar dips too low. Yeah. So all these little hacks, a strong why, understanding where the cravings come from, and then all of these little hacks and like, be kind to yourself. I love that. Yeah. I have dogs. So it's natural for us to just like go on a walk after they eat or usually we'll all eat at the same time, you know, but then, yeah, it's kind of just, just like a natural thing. Like, Hey, now we've eaten, now we have to go walk and then we come back and it is always better than just like eating and sitting down and vegging out or something like that. Cause you're able to kind of like help your digestive system kind of move through, um, everything you just ate. Yeah. And don't underestimate the power of ritual. Like I think for a lot of people mm. eating something sweet after a meal is like a ritual, you know, it's yeah. a closer, a closure to the meal feels like a little treat. So keep all of that, but just substitute the refined sugar for something that's more like in your, like in, you know, more supportive of your health. Yeah. So like, I love, I love teas. I mean, we talked about CCFT, but like you could do like a lemongrass rose tea. Like you could do so many teas that almost like feel like they are this beautiful dessert, like closure, but it's an herbal tea. Yeah. I love that. Tea is like everything to me. It's funny when I go on, like, I'll do like little fasting or I'll be like, Oh, I'm just going to eat like really simply this week. For some reason, when I do that, when I kind of cut out the, the noise of like the other stuff that I eat, when I eat really simply, my body just craves so much tea. Like it's yeah. insane when I cut out sugar or any 
like I don't eat a lot of processed food, but you know, it's, we live in the U S it filters in and out. And when I cut all that stuff out or like eating out at restaurants or whatever, my body's just craving so much herbal tea. But I've noticed that when I'm not, when I'm just kind of not conscious of what I'm eating or whatever, I'm not drinking as much tea. So there's definitely like a correlation there for sure. That's so interesting. Yeah. I love, I use teas a lot to stop eating late into the night and to avoid this like need for something sweet after a meal. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about late night eating. I'm glad you mentioned that because I (laughs) have such a problem with late night eating and it's only because I work late. So then I'm hungry because I've like, you know, activated my mind and burned all this energy. I love to talk about late night eating. Like, is it as bad for you as people say, or like, what's your take on it? Yeah. I mean, again, you know, I always come try to come at these things from like compassion because I have eaten late into the night myself. So I don't want to take like a holier thou, like you have to be <laughs> holier than thou, perf- you have to be perfect approach. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, if we do take a look at the evidence, um, consistently eating late into the night is really not great for us. Like it mm. really disrupts our circadian rhythm. You know, going back to that point about being connected to nature, we are an integral part of nature and nature likes to slow down and shut down at night. And by eating late at night, we're asking our digestive processes to wake up and do the Mm. opposite of what they naturally want to do. They naturally want to rest, repair and digest, not like wake up and have to process and metabolize and assimilate food. So, um, I mean, my biggest tip is like, you know, I know we've already said it, but like herbal teas can be a really, really powerful way to stop the late night eating habit. So late night eating isn't great for you. I would say that that we have a lot of evidence that finishing dinner by 7 or 8 p.m. and then just closing the kitchen for the night can have powerful effects on your health, your metabolic health. And there's even interesting evidence that it can reduce cancer risk in women, uh, breast cancer risk, which I find really, really fascinating. So finishing dinner by 7 Yeah. Finishing dinner by seven or eight and then giving yourself like your body goes into repair mode when you stop eating. Yeah. Um, And you want that repair and restoration to prevent disease, DNA damage, aging, that kind of thing. So, you know, you don't have to be perfect about it. Like you can do it five days a week and then allow yourself, you know, maybe you, you go out to dinner with friends and it's a late dinner once a week. I don't think that's going to be the issue. We know that what you do consistently matters. Right. So, what you do, what you do most of the time matters. So take an 80, 20 approach, 80% of the time you're wrapping up early, 20% of the time you're giving yourself some grace and slack and kind yeah. of just doing whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, obviously we know that an overnight fast of at least 13 hours is really helpful, like 12 to 13 hours. You don't have to do 16, eight. Everybody doesn't have to do 16 hours of fasting. I know it's very trendy right now. And I think it can be very beneficial. But if you wrap up dinner by seven or eight and then break your fast the next morning at eight or nine, you've automatically done a 13 hour fast, which can have really, really beneficial effects on gut health. Like I said, cancer risk, um, metabolic health, you know, and you will sleep better. People will sleep better. It's like in the beginning, it's like, oh my gosh, I can't imagine not eating like my little late night snack. Um, You'll be surprised. Again, it's a habit. It can be broken just like it was built and you will feel and sleep better. Yeah. I love that. I love that quote. It's a habit. It can be broken just like it was built. That's such a great quote. I love that. Um, I literally just made that up, but I like it too. (laughs) It's really good. I feel like that's going to be your next Instagram post. (laughs) Yeah, probably. Um, yeah, I love that. I, yeah, it's interesting because I find myself naturally fasting for 13 hours. So even if I'll eat later around like nine or something, I'll naturally not want to eat until like 10 AM the next day. So, you know, it, it feels like, you know, we're in tune, but yeah, it's nice to kind of also, if you're drinking coffee, like first thing in the morning, or you have like kind of this, a weird relationship with caffeine, I feel like that can also, um, change the way that you look at fasting and feeding your body and like your food habits and stuff. So, um, I think there's a lot to say about that as well. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, in terms of like how to stop the late night cravings, I would again, go back to some of the things we talked about earlier. I think making sure that you have enough fiber Mm. at dinner and protein, whether it's, if you're plant-based, plant-based protein and fiber, otherwise, you know, whatever source of protein you enjoy and fiber can also really send that satiety signal to the brain. 
Um, so you don't feel the need then to go munching on something random. Yeah, definitely. I love that. So I kind of want to like go back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, we were talking about anxiety. I just, I had this question that I wrote down and I, I think it's important to talk about, um, healing your anxiety with food and spices and different foods and different ways of eating that can kind of help like soothe that anxiousness, just because I know that so many people are so anxious right now in so many different ways. Um, So I just love to hear your take on like being anxiety free with food. Yeah, I mean, I discovered anxiety through the pandemic. I never thought of myself as someone who experienced anxiety. I have friends and family who have, you know, anxiety issues or challenges. And I was like, oh, I don't really know what that is. I'm such a yeah. positive bubbly person. <laughs> yeah. But like we have been through the ringer like the mm-hmm. last two years as a society. I mean, it has not been trivial for everything to be upended. So I want to normalize a little bit the fact that we are feeling more anxious. I think mm-hmm. it's totally natural. Now, obviously, we don't want to be debilitated by it or like you know, totally hijacked by it. So I do think food and overall health play a big role. I mean, we all know, or maybe we've heard of, you know, the gut brain axis. So we know mm-hmm. that our gut health is intimately linked to our mood, our brain health. There's con- communication between the gut and the brain, our gut microbiome, if we feed it correctly, will produce compounds that have beneficial effects on mood and brain health. So I would say, um, you know, the biggest piece of advice I can give people is start nourishing your gut with real whole unprocessed foods. Mm. Even though we feel like when we're in the anxiety spiral, we really want the short-term comfort foods, which are often processed junky foods, Mm. but it's like, you're getting, you're trapping yourself in that spiral. So, you know, just taking a step back and saying, I'm going to nourish my body, my brain, my gut and the gut brain access with real whole unprocessed foods and make them super delicious with all of these incredible spices and herbs and like the great recipes that you share, you know, um, add, I mean, a lot of these spices actually nourish our gut microbiome. They have anti-inflammatory effects, which then affects our brain and our mood. I mean, believe it or not, heightened inflammation can contribute to more anxiety. So bringing all that down with real whole unprocessed foods, eat the rainbow, aim for 30 plus plants a week. I know it sounds like a lot, but like, think about it. Like you make a pasta with a tomato sauce with some garlic and onion and maybe some broccoli and some chili flakes and fresh basil. You're already incorporated eight plants right there. You know, throw in some zucchini and carrot um, or mushrooms and now it's 10. And there is actual research to suggest that when you get to about 30 plant varieties in your diet a week, you positively impact your gut microbes, which then positively impact your brain health and your mood and your cravings, which we talked mm. about earlier. Yeah. So eating a, you know, a more diverse, uh, a higher diversity of plants, a higher number of plants, real whole unprocessed foods as much as possible, um, slowly but surely is going to really boost your brain health and your mood and reduce anxiety. And then we know that there are actual foods that can have an impact. So like omega-3 rich foods, if you're plant-based, chia seeds, flax seeds, um, really, really powerful sources of omega-3. You know, um, if you eat wild caught fish, that can really help. So omega-3 is really important. If you don't, then I would consider a supplement because that Mm. can really help brain health and mood as well. And then like the berries, like there's some really interesting research on blueberries, dark chocolate. One of my favorite snacks is wild card blueberries, dark chocolate chips without refined sugar and like some cinnamon. Um, all brain health boosting, delicious, soul nourishing, you know, kind of snack. Yeah, so that's like my husband doesn't have to be his favorite snack, actually. <laughs> I love that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Or people take like raspberries and stuff a little chocolate chip, like a dark chocolate chip inside. And it feels like this little treat. So, you know, it doesn't have to be about deprivation or again, like eating bland, boring food. It can be really exciting, but yes, food can have a huge impact on anxiety and brain health via the gut brain axis. Definitely. I love this quote that you said the other day. Um, Here, wait, let me find it. You said health is sometimes doing less instead of doing more. And I just like absolutely love that because we definitely live in a culture where it's like, oh, try this or try that or do this instead. And I think it's just a nice reminder to just like 
yeah, simplify and to just do, do less and you don't have to overcomplicate things to be healthy. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm so glad that quote resonated. I mean, it's come from my own journey. Like I'm Mm. definitely someone who can get really type A and like try to be a perfectionist about things and be really hard on myself. And, you know, I think through the pandemic, like I was still trying to do everything right, like biohack my way to perfect health. And I was like, I don't feel great. Like I, you know, I started seeing a therapist in, in the pandemic. And I think that has really helped me realize that yes, sometimes all this like excessive pursuit of excellence and like all the things wellness and like all the biohacking can actually cause more stress and anxiety. And it has a real biochemical effect in our bodies. And really going back to that idea, like one of my other favorite quotes is everything in me. I think it's like, I'm paraphrasing, but everything in nature is accomplished or you know, nature accomplishes everything without ever being in a rush um, Mm. or something like that. Like, so somehow we feel like more is more and we need all the to do's, whether it's work or wellness and like it backfires, you know, our nervous system is not designed to be in hyperdrive. So that's why that, that's where that quote came from. And I really think like rest and rejuvenation and like relaxation might be one of the most underrated wellness hacks of all (laughs) not doing anything totally I'm like yeah yeah I'm a nine hour a night sleeper kind of person like I need nine hours everyone says like seven or eight I'm like I need at least nine if I'm not sleeping laying in my bed doing absolutely nothing in order to feel like I can tackle the next day yeah kudos to you we need to celebrate that more and get less off the like hustle bustle train you know oh I know so many people in my life are like oh my god you sleep so much like you need to wake up earlier or whatever and I'm like no I really don't want to (laughs) like I'm in this phase of my life where I feel like I can you know sleep until eight o'clock and that 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 works for me so yeah it's 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 nice it sounds amazing to to me I know right totally (laughs) um what was I gonna just say So I would love to talk a little bit about like your cookbook and just like all the things that you have going on, like outside of your social media platforms. I've had a lot of cookbook authors on here. I've written a cookbook. Um, What was that experience like for you writing a cookbook and just getting all of your thoughts down into like one place? Yeah, my gosh. Um, I self-published the cookbook, um, which I sometimes I'm like, I don't even know how I pulled that off. Oh my gosh. You know, that's a lot. I also, yeah, I was pregnant with my daughter. I wrote the cookbook through my pregnancy. I mean, I feel like anyone who's written a cookbook probably looks back and thinks like, how did I even do that? <laughs> like it's, yes. it's, but I just had this like um, deep desire to write a book that was a that was a cookbook and a spice resource. So really like, um, you know, helping people understand why some of these spices can be so beneficial, how to use them, how to celebrate them daily in your kitchen, and then how to actually cook with them. So um, I'm really proud of the book. I somehow, like I said, can't really believe I pulled it off, but um, it's out there. It's called Spice Spice Baby. You can get it at spicebicebaby.com. Um, I you know, now I look back because it came out in 2018 and I'm like, gosh, I've evolved so much as a person and a cook and a chef. And like that, I sometimes I'm like, oh, like, I don't know. Like, I feel like I judge the recipes as not being that great, but then people buy it and they really enjoy the recipe. So I remind myself that, you know, it was what I created at the time and it's, Mm -hmm. it served a purpose, but I am, you know, working on a second book. Um, I would love to do a second book that just is more like, aligned with the way I cook now definitely more plant forward and plant-based than I was back then um yeah so you know I feel like it's a labor of love and it's not easy but you feel this calling to do it and like you have to do it and 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 then you do and you're like wow I can't believe I actually wrote an entire book with all those recipes oh my gosh I know I think about that all the time I know I have this like inkling to do a second book too and my husband's like are we really gonna are we really gonna do all that again (laughs) I know. Oh my gosh. Totally. It's a definite commitment. Do you think that you would self-publish again or do you think you'd go through a publisher? Yeah, no, I wouldn't. Um, you know, my platform was smaller back then. Um, 
but I, I managed to crowdfund and get enough pre-orders to do the whole thing, uh, to self-publish the whole thing. It's just so much work to self-publish. Like yeah. you have to do everything. Um, so no, I would probably go the publisher route this time. Let's see. I don't know. So many things going on. It's like, you know, hard to find the time sometimes. Um, but I know it'll happen eventually. Yeah, definitely. You have a podcast too, right? I do. Uh, it's called Radical Vitality. It's Love on it. all the platforms where podcasts can be listened to. Um, there's a ton of amazing episodes on there. If people want to hear about yeah. you know, all things health, wellness, science. Um, I am going to resurrect the podcast with a new season, hopefully this summer. So I'm excited nice. for that. Yeah. Nice. Love a resurrection. Yeah. I had to take a break from podcasting for a while too. It's definitely a lot to like get guests and do all the things. So yeah, I feel like it's nice to have little breaks. I don't know how people do there. Like I know some big podcasters out there have done an episode every week for like years and years and years. I mean, I literally think it's their full-time job. Like that's yeah. how much time and commitment it takes. And that, you know, but if you're doing a million things and you also have like I don't know, other platforms, clients, like other kind of work, um, recipe creation, whatever, yeah. to then also keep the podcast running, I found. So I, I'm, I'm moving in the direction of seasons. I'm going to try to do like two or three seasons a year and just yeah. crank out a few episodes that are valuable and helpful and then take a break. Yes, that's like literally exactly where I'm at right now. And it's so much better. So it yeah. really works out. Yeah, yeah, love that. Yeah, But I love podcasting because like, you know, we're chatting and it's like just so nice in this day and age of everything is 60 seconds and everyone is like kind of, you know, have a hard time, has a hard time focusing. And it's nice to actually stop, focus and connect and go a little bit deeper. Yeah. Um, so I really do love this like long form kind of exchange. 1000%. I always say like, I feel like I'm a better person because of my podcast. Like I just feel I've connected with so many people. I've learned so much, like, holy moly, like my amount of information and just like the way that I see the world is so different just from being able to have these conversations with, with strangers that then turn into your friends. Cause then, you know, you have this intimate conversation and you're like, Oh my gosh, like we know each other on this whole other level now. So yeah, it's really nice. Totally agree. Okay. So I end every podcast this season by doing a speed round. So I'm going to ask okay. you a bunch of random questions and, yeah. um, yeah, just answer whatever's on your heart. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. So what's your favorite plant-based meal right now? Chickpea curry. What, like what color curry? Like a chana masala, like an Indian chickpea <sighs> curry with tomatoes, yeah. onion, ginger, garlic, cumin, coriander, turmeric, chili, chickpeas. I throw a little spinach in there. Okay. Now I'm hungry. I know <laughs> this whole podcast is actually making me super hungry. All I can think about is lentils. <laughs> oh my God. I know. Yum. Okay. So are you a night owl or an early bird? I'm a night owl. I'm trying to change it, but I think I'm wired to be a night owl, sadly. Same. Oh my gosh. Thank you. You're literally the only guest I've had on that says that they are a night owl. I'm a night owl too. I can't shake it. Well, you know, believe it or not, there, um, there are chronotypes in biology. They're called like people who are actually wired to be more night owls than early birds. Mm. I think I'm definitely wired, but I have children and I have to wake up early to get them to school. So I'm like trying, <laughs> but I can never really fall asleep properly before 1130 PM. Like it just, I, I literally can just lie there and I'm like, okay. And then 1130, I'm like, okay. So those people who like my husband is an early bird. He can sleep from nine to five. We're totally the opposite. Yes. Same, same. Oh my gosh. That's good. I, I like, there's someone else that's a night owl. I'm like, okay, this whole this yeah. night owl stuff is not that bad. What is your biggest passion outside of your job? Um, oh my gosh. My biggest passion outside of my job is probably like going to restaurants, <laughs> trying new food, like yes. trying new foods. Um, my job is food, but actually eating like other people's creations and other people's food and really yes. like getting into it and understanding. Oh my gosh. Like I, yeah, I'm, I love dissecting flavors and like enjoying creative constructs from other chefs, like total foodie. Yeah. That's you, my just passion. Wanna, eating. you just want a contest on tasting things, right? Oh my God, I did. Yeah. Food Network had this show called Money Hungry and I had to taste 15 things and guess them. And I won 50. I actually won. I, I can't believe I actually won. I was the only contestant that won that season. <laughs> total, like total surreal moment. 
what was the weirdest thing that you had to taste? Oh my God, alligator, fried alligator. And you knew it was alligator. Yeah, and I only knew it was alligator because of the way it looked. And like, they gave me a clue that it was like an exotic meat. And I just remember having had alligator with my husband, I think in Florida and he was, or New Orleans, I can't remember. And he was like, you have to try, you have to try it. Cause we were, you know, you have to be adventurous. And I was like, I don't want to eat alligator. So I don't actually like it. I would never eat it again. But like, I was able to place it in context of that food memory um, that had more to do with like where I was, who I was with than the yeah. actual dish. Yeah. And it, like a lot of the show was like that, like where I was at the time when I ate that thing one time and I was able to remember that, that that's what it was. Oh my gosh. How bizarre. I love that. That's, that's so funny. Okay. Uh, where is your favorite place in the whole world? Oh, probably my hometown in India, Pune. Oh, I love that so much. When was the last time you went back there? Too long ago, 2019. Oh, before the pandemic. Yeah. 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 Well, I hope you can go back soon. I hope so too. Um, what's a big personal goal you have for yourself this year? Big personal goal this year is to, um, to slow down, to slow down a little bit. Um, work-wise, I feel like as content creators, we are like, go, go, go. You know, you're never doing enough. You can always do more. So-and-so yeah. is doing more. Trying to recalibrate and be like, I, I, I wanted, I want to follow that quote, you know, everything is accomplished in nature, yet no one is in a rush. Like, I just want to do it from a place of creativity, joy, love, inspiration, rather than that, like hustle mentality. Mm. Um, I know, you know, I know like hustle can pay off and like, we all have to hustle sometimes, but I don't want that to be like my way of being all the time. So slowing down and still feeling like I'm creating and making meaning and helping people and like channeling my creativity. Yeah. I love that. It's so easy to burn out. Right. Cause like, totally. I love what you said. There's always like that thing that you could always be doing more, be doing better, you know, produce that new piece of content. I feel that so much too, like constantly, it's just always there. So, um, yeah, that's yeah. a nice reminder. I love that. Um, okay. Let's see who or what are you most inspired by right now? Um, I am truly very inspired by nature. I know it sounds cheesy, but we recently bought a place upstate outside of New York. And every time I go there, I just like sit and I watch the birds or the chipmunks or like whatever random animal will show up. And, you know, I'm just feeling this like need or desire to be more in nature, take walks mm. in nature, like go to the park more, like put my feet on the ground more. I'm just feeling like there's a lot of wisdom there, a lot of healing there and inspiration there. So hoping I can keep doing that. Yeah. I love that. I don't think that's cheesy. I think that's what we all need right now. Um, okay. If you could change one thing about the world, what would it be? Oh my gosh. Especially this week. Um, I just wish we could be more connected with one another. I think on the one hand, we are very connected. We feel because of all our social media platforms and phones and whatever. But I think on some level, we're quite disconnected. Um, you know, we've lost and, and therefore we don't know when people are hurting or suffering or we don't want to acknowledge when we're hurting or suffering. We want everything to be normal and okay. And like, I just feel like, yeah, more, con more deeper, more meaningful connection with one another. Yeah, I feel that for sure. Um, this is a fun one. If you were stranded on an Island and you could only bring three things, what would you bring? I would bring water because you can go without food for many, many days, but you can't really go without water for that mm. long. Apparently. <laughs> I would probably bring, um, gosh, like my spice box. And I know I'm supposed to say that, but like, I'm just thinking like my spice box and probably like a box of matches. That way I could cook something that I forage, make it taste good and like not perish on the island. <laughs> I love it very on maybe brand. I've been watching I've been watching whatever my husband what's that show that everybody watches survivor or something yeah. I don't know yeah. the show where they go on this island and like yeah my husband watches it so sometimes I'll catch glimpses I'm like oh my gosh how are they doing this like they're eating ants and like yeah so I'm like at least I can make it taste good <laughs> 
put some all the random on the hands. things. <laughs> yeah. Um, what advice would you give your younger self? Um, to not wait for the fear to disappear before doing something to recognize that there will always be some element of fear when you try anything new and to sort of do it anyway. Yes. Love that. That's so good. And final, final question. Do you have any final words of wisdom for our audience? My final words of wisdom are maybe something that I've sort of peppered throughout the conversation, which is that there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of like high energy, high intensity, go, 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 do this, do that. This is how you're going to achieve optimal health, wellness, vitality. And I feel like the opposite may be true, which is slowing down, reconnecting with ourselves, reconnecting with one another, reconnecting with nature, throwing the to-do list in the trash for a little bit and just like going back to that intuition and that sort of state of slow flow, um, I think is ultimately what we need, what is going to heal us and what is going to give us the vitality we so desperately seek. Yeah. I love that. Well, I'm just going to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you so much to our guest, Kancha. And if you guys love the show, go ahead and reach out to her on Instagram and let her know that you heard it. Or if you came here from her page, what's up? So happy to have you here in our community. Um, And again, leave a review on Apple Podcasts if you love the show. Give us a five-star rating on Spotify and um, share with your friends. That's the best way to get it out there. And don't forget to sign up for the free training at www.chefbay.kitchen and it will be an automatic pop-up to get you to sign up so it'll be right there super easy okay you guys I think that's all I got for you today hope you stay safe out there wear your non-toxic natural sunscreen to prevent sunburn because I got a wicked sunburn last week and um yeah be kind to one another and do something nice for a stranger today okay I'll see you guys later bye